A Google search for nature versus nurture delivers nearly four million results. Parents knowingly and children unknowingly wrestle with the implications of this debate, hoping that there's a magic formula that will render their future adult a bind blinding success and not a violent menace to society. <laughs> there are many, many ways our brains can become hurt. Recent research out of the University of Michigan has revealed an interesting fact about the brain. The same receptor system that's activated when responding to physical pain is also activated when responding to emotional pain. Opioid chemicals are released when we experience pain physically and are released in the same regions of the brain when we experience social rejection. Our brain architecture and social environment engage in an intricate, intimate dance to determine if and how hurt is expressed and how resilient we are to bounce back. The research you will hear this evening is simultaneously jarring, enlightening, and we hope will change the way you view our world and the people in it. Tonight's special guests are some of the thought leaders changing the conversation surrounding violence and the individuals who perpetrate it. Our moderator, Tim Phillips, will start things off. Next, we will hear from Jack Shonkoff, then Joshua Buckholtz, and thirdly, Jessica Stern. Lastly, they will all converse together before we take questions from you, the audience. So please join me in welcoming to the stage, Tim Phillips. Thank you, Lisa. I guess I would fit the category of the jarring speaker. Um, I am the uh, co-founder of Beyond Conflict, and it is our pleasure to be a co-sponsor here tonight and to be here with such distinguished uh, panelists. And I have the um, easy task, and mine is to say, how did our organization develop an interest in brain science and conflict? And I'll say very simply that 22 years ago, we started a nonprofit that's based here in Cambridge in Eastern Europe, and very much interested in the transition from communism to democracy. And the question was, in this transition, where you had dissidents who were now leading these new democratic countries, could they learn from the experience of others who have been through similar trans, uh, transformations? People who had come from dictatorship, uh, countries that had suffered repression and human rights violations and trauma. And a lot of people told us that people can't really learn from the experience of others. Each situation is unique. And we sort of intuitively said, well, that's somewhat naive that while each country will have its own unique experience, at the end of the day, people respond as humans to the experience of repression or conflict, and that once you get past the surface differences, there's great learning to be, to be had. And that intuition uh, resulted in only in a conference we did that brought together uh, who's who of leaders of post-communist uh, Europe, but leaders from Argentina and Chile and Spain after Franco. And from that one meeting grew an organization where we've spent the last 22 years you know, sharing human experience, bringing together leaders, often former enemies, combatants, and others to say, here's how we came out the other side. Here's how we dealt with the legacy of trauma uh, on a national level, on a community level, or on a personal level. And yet, we have seen, all of us, coming in here tonight, I'm sure, listening to the radio, and I'm sure with this crowd it was NPR, uh, <laughs> You know, the current situation in Syria, uh, what's happening in the, in the Crimea, uh, the negotiations with Iran. And we see in Northern Ireland, a lot of people thought 15 years ago that the Good Friday Peace Agreement solved that issue. And yet President Obama spent or sent uh, his special envoy, Richard Haas, there to try to get the political leaders to figure out a way to deal with their past. And nobody could come to an agreement. 15 years after the Good Friday Agreement to say, here's how we deal with the legacy of, of division. So the question is, what are we missing? And so that's a big part of what led us to this. And when we uh, worked with the Museum of Science, it was to ask the question, can we learn anything from science? Can we learn anything from those working uh, in the human brain and also people who have been on the front lines of trying to understand you know, what leads people to violence? And so with that, um, I'll just quickly uh, move 
uh, to say that we are living in an interesting moment of history. I know with both uh, Jack and, and Josh, you'll get a very exhilarating presentation from the frontiers of science. And one of the things that uh, we had a discussion earlier uh, that really resonated with my colleagues and I was that we know that cognition, and you'll learn, has a neural basis in the brain, but so does emotion. And if you can understand how the brain experiences experience, then we might start to develop a better understanding of what drives us to conflict, no matter where we live. And so with that, I want to turn over to our first speaker, Jack, and, uh, and then he'll introduce the other speakers. And thank you for coming this evening. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate the introduction. So, um, good evening, everybody. I, so, in my um, brief presentation tonight, I'm going to give you a little bit of a bird's eye view and a crash course in neurobiology in 21st century answers to this nature versus nurture uh, debate, which is really not a debate anymore. That's kind of of interest for the 20th century because there is no nurture without nature and vice versa. We'll talk about that a little bit. But uh, what I want to do, I'm a pediatrician by training, so I'm going to give you a sense of what we know about how the interaction between experience and genetics kind of lays a foundation early in life for all the health and learning and behavior that follows. Uh, uh, I do not have the answer to resolving conflict in Syria or, um, or learning the lessons of, of what went well in Ireland. but. It, but this is an important introduction for you of, of what we know, um, what does 21st century science have to say about the development of the brain? So for starters, um, there's no question that early life experience kind of literally, literally is built into our bodies, uh, in our brain and in all of the organ systems, um, for better or worse. So children who live in a relatively regularized, predictable, stable, kind of safe, responsive environment, um, those experiences are shaping the circuitry of the brain as it's developing, building strong circuits for all of the thinking and feeling and all of the other skills that are built into the brain. And um, it doesn't provide an immunization against bad things happening to you later, but it, it forms a foundation early on. And all of us have, every animal species has a stress response system. Um, just for a moment, every, I, I don't, since you talk out there, I don't know most of you, but I know since you're alive and you're here and you made it here and you'll go home, that everybody here knows what stress feels like. And um, so think for a moment about the time you were the most stressed you've ever felt in your life. And when I'm, when I'm talking about stress now, I'm not talking about the cause of the stress. I'm talking about your body's physiological response to stress. So whether you feel it as a pain in the back of your neck or in your lower back or you're sweating or it's in the pit of your stomach, whatever, a massive headache, you can feel your heart racing. What you're feeling is your stress system activated, which is your friend. It is good to have a stress response system. It's what allows us to deal with threat or danger. Your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, your blood sugar goes up, your, your stress hormones are elevated, your inflammatory system is activated. And this basically, this is the fight or flight response Every animal species has it. It's designed to optimally get you physiologically and mentally ready to fight or run, <laughs> or whatever variation uh, we need to deal with stress. And then it comes, it goes back to baseline. And um, and the problem, and that's good. It's good to have it. The problem is when, particularly when you're young, when the stress system is activated most of the time, or is at very high levels for prolonged periods of time. So. All of these physiological responses that allow you to deal with acute danger or threat, think about that feeling when you're stressed out and think about what that must be doing to your body if you felt that way most of the time. And it literally has a wear and tear effect on the body. It disrupts brain architecture. It accelerates atherosclerosis. It increases insulin resistance, making it more likely to get diabetes. It affects your immune system and suppresses your immunity, even though it activates it in the short run. And it actually can affect gene expression. So um, this is an, an area of research that has been around for a while, but is now exploding. And we're going to talk about just the brain tonight. Okay, but now I'll kind of put my pediatric hat on. Right. So this is basically trying to use this 
this revolution in biology to understand how we could optimally promote health and prevent disease, physical and mental illness and other problems by understanding the corrosive and dangerous impacts of chronic stress. Now, let's put it in the context of this country. Um, different countries, different contexts. This country, among the things that's unique about this country, it has no sympathy for people, for stress, right? This is a, this is a political culture that says, you know, get over it. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Um, it, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger. Um, look at that guy over there. He came from terrible circumstances and look at what he is now. The rest of you who are complaining, just be like that person, right? So what we had to do was think about how we could explain that there are different kinds of stress. And my, again, my focus here is, is young children and my focus is the stress response. So we created a very simple taxonomy of three types of stress. Positive stress is character building stress. Again, I'm gonna talk about young children. This is the stress of a first day in a childcare center where you don't know anybody. It's the stress of getting a shot at the doctor's office. The stress of not being allowed to eat 10 cookies because you want them or having to share your toys. That causes, it activates the stress system. Heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, all those things happen. But what happens is in the context of supportive relationships, adults kind of help kids learn to deal with that stress, um, help children begin to develop their own coping skills to deal with whatever's threatening them. And in the process, the stress system's coming back to baseline. And that's good, it protects the brain. Okay? Um, the next category we call tolerable stress. This is more than just, you know, you have to go in for a nap. This may be a death or a serious illness in the family. It might be surviving a natural disaster like the earthquake in Haiti or Katrina in New Orleans or the tsunami in the, in the, in, in the Pacific. Um, or it might be a, being a survivor of an act of terrorism where it's clearly it's a huge threat, where the question comes up, who is gonna be okay after this? Who's gonna end up with post-traumatic symptoms or post-traumatic stress disorder? Before we knew the biology instinctively, we knew that at times like that, children need adults to make them feel safe, to let them know that they're gonna be okay. Um, and what that does is it brings the stress system down and it also helps children develop abilities for themselves to be able to cope and adapt to stress. Which leads us to the third category that we call toxic stress. This is pro excessive prolonged activation of the stress response system. Not just a bad day, please. If anybody leaves here before the end of the session, when you use the back door, like you were instructed, it's, I, you know, I, friends come up and they say, oh my God, I've had the worst day, I'm experiencing toxic stress. And I say, do you have anybody you can turn to? Is there anybody you can talk to? Oh yeah, I have a, you're not experiencing toxic stress. Toxic stress is for children who live in circumstances where there's chronic, serious chronic neglect, recurrent abuse, recurrent exposure to violence without, violence without a sense of safety or protection. So all of these aspects of the stress system are activated for long periods of time. And so for example, things like cortisol, the most frequently studied stress hormone, is great for the short term in terms of dealing with threat, but elevated cortisol over long periods of time actually disrupts brain circuits. It kills brain cells. It disrupts some of the circuits that are being built. And some parts of the brain, more, even more susceptible than others, the prefrontal cortex that Josh will talk about, is exquisitely sensitive to this. So we're beginning to understand, um, opening up that black box and saying, so why is it that individuals who grow up in poverty and experiencing other stresses, why do they get sick more? Why do they have more illnesses they get older? Why do they have more problems focusing attention and learning in school? It's not simply a motivation issue. It may have to do with disruption of important parts of the brain. So this is your one and a half minute uh, course in neurobiology. Uh, literally, it's just a little more than a minute and a half that summarizes all the basic principles of toxic stress. Learning to deal with stress is an important part of healthy development. When experiencing stress, the stress response system is activated. The body and brain go on alert. There's an adrenaline rush, increased heart rate, and an increase in stress hormone levels. When the stress is relieved after a short time, or a young child receives support from caring adults, the stress response winds down and the body quickly returns to normal. In severe situations, such as ongoing abuse and neglect, where there is no caring adult to act as a buffer against the stress, the stress response stays activated. Even when there is no apparent physical harm, the extended absence of response from adults can activate the stress response system. Constant activation of the stress response overloads developing systems, 
with serious lifelong consequences for the child. This is known as toxic stress. Over time, this results in a stress response system set permanently on high alert. In the areas of the brain dedicated to learning and reasoning, the neural connections that comprise brain architecture are weaker and fewer in number. Science shows that the prolonged activation of stress hormones in early childhood can actually reduce neural connections in these important areas of the brain at just the time when they should be growing new ones. Toxic stress can be avoided if we ensure that the environments in which children grow and develop are nurturing, stable, and engaging. Video, this video took about a year and a half to produce, and it wasn't because of the technical challenges of making a video. Um, it's because this was done collaboratively um, among cinematographers and a, a group of scientists who insisted on absolute scientific accuracy for this. So I can, even having a, like a real bona fide neuroscientist sitting in front of me, I can feel confident that this isn't like I'm not making this up, it's not my point of view, this is, this is what the science tells us. So I'm going to just very briefly show you two examples of what the consequences of this could look like and, and what um, a kind of new understanding of the short-term and more important long-term impacts of excessive, what we call toxic stress in early childhood can produce. So these data that I'm going to show you come from a study that was done in Dunedin, New Zealand, a small city in New Zealand about 35, 40 years ago now. A longitudinal, so-called longitudinal birth cohort study was begun. Every pregnant woman in the city was, was approached to enroll in a study that would begin collecting information during the pregnancy and then follow the child who was born for as long as the funding would go on. And this is a place where actually people continued to fund the study, so we learned a lot of interesting things. Um, these data I'm going to show you come from, and so remember, everything was collected as they went. So information collected during pregnancy, and then medical history, behavioral observations, blood samples were drawn, a variety of measures. This is looking at the levels of a substance called C-reactive protein in the blood at age 32 years. C-reactive protein is an inflammatory marker. It's been associated with elevated risk for heart disease. So think of it as like an elevated cholesterol, even though it's a different system. Um, it doesn't mean you have heart disease, but it means you're someone at greater risk for heart disease. So at age 32, um, all of the healthy, normally developing 32-year-olds in this study, of those, about a little more than 15% had an elevated C-reactive protein. It means they're somewhat at greater risk of heart disease. It doesn't mean they have it. Most of them won't get heart disease, and they're probably largely genetically determined in terms of the normal variation of population. Next was 32-year-olds who had a diagnosis of depression were found to have, on average, higher levels of C-reactive protein. This was not a new finding. It's been well documented that there's elevated inflammation. Remember, this is one of the parts of the stress response system in individuals who have clinical depression. Um, a lot of discussion among scientists about which came first, the inflammation <laughs> or the depression, but they, they go hand in hand. That's a well-known association. The next finding was not so well known. There were maybe one or two studies that were moving in this direction. Now, since then, there have been a huge number of additional studies. Individuals who had a documented history of having been maltreated as children at age 32 years had higher levels of C-reactive protein even than people with depression. And those who had both depression at age 32 and documented maltreatment as a child, um, about two out of five of those people had elevated C-reactive protein. Um, this is a statistical difference among of these. Now, what does this mean? Is this a smoking gun for anything? No, nothing. In, no single sci study in science is a smoking gun for anything, almost. But this is part of a growing body of evidence that there is an association between uh, um, significant adversity in childhood and chronic inflammation. And for those of you who kind of follow this, Inflammation is one of the hot topics in biomedicine right now. It, seems, it underlies a lot of chronic diseases, which, by the way, uh, occur across all social classes, but happen to be more common among people who are poor, people of color, people who have had difficult lives. Um, so the take-home message from this slide is that whether you have a conscious memory or not, um, whether you were too young to remember when you were an adult or whether you repressed it, the body remembers 
significant maltreatment. There are biological memories that continue into adulthood, and in this case, are associated with an elevated risk for heart disease, which, by the way, in other studies have been shown consistently that poor people get more cardiovascular disease than people who've had relatively comfortable lives. Um, last slide. So aside from the impact on physical health, there's this kind of fascinating question about what are the impacts on behavior and on emotional development going into adulthood. So this is, um, I really like this study because it's very dramatic, uh, done by uh, Seth Pollack and colleagues at Wisconsin. So this was looking at um, school-aged children who in their early childhood years had been victims of significant physical abuse. And the following test was done. Many of you have, are familiar with this paradigm. This is a, these are morphed facial expressions uh, reflecting emotion. So if you can look, pick any line you want and see whether it goes from happy to fearful or happy to sad. Same person with kind of different expressions that reflect emotion. The ability to read emotions on faces develops very early in life. If you want to think among some of the things that are fundamentally essential for a kind of a adaptive social development emotionally is to be able to read a face and say, is this person happy? Is this person angry? Is this person sad? Babies learn that, and we know in the brain where that circuitry is. It's, it's a perfect example of something that is shaped by experience. It's not on automatic pilot. The brain is primed to learn how to read emotions, but your experience helps you learn that. And everything that goes on early on is adapting to the environment and assuming that the environment when you're young is a predictor of what the environment's going to be when you're old. So we'll go down and just kind of take these two dimensions of from angry to fearful and angry to sad. And the way the test goes is you show this to a child face by face, and you say, tell me how this person feels. You know, and so we kind of start at this end and say, well, that person looks angry to me. And they say, it kind of still looks angry. And kind of, you know, well, maybe a little bit angry. And uh, in a healthy, normal population that hasn't had significant experience with maltreatment, about halfway through the line, kids start saying, you know, I, you know, it's hard. I don't know what this person is feeling. And then it's kind of, you know, well, this is maybe looking a little bit, I don't know, scared. Until you get to the end and you say, well, that person looks fearful or from angry to sad. So the test is normed this way at the 50% mark. Halfway through, it changes from clearly angry to a little less angry to ambiguous to a little fearful, maybe to very fearful. What, and that's, this is what you get. What do you do if you give this test to children who were significantly maltreated when they're younger? This is the break point. They start and they say angry when, every, when, the, when the face is angry. Excuse me. And then they say angry, angry, angry. And when children who have not had this kind of experience get to this point, they say, I don't know, it's hard to say. And kids who've been maltreated say angry. And they say angry. They say angry. And they say still angry still angry. It's not until they get almost to the end that they see something other than anger. Okay. Um, so what is, what is this? Is this? So here's an interesting philosophical question that we had before. Is this, is this a, a problem in behavior, or is this some kind of mental health impairment, or is this what it looks like later of what a healthy adaptive response to a, 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 an unhealthy situation looks like? When you're in an environment where anger means you're going to be, the chances that you're going to be hit or maltreated goes up, you learn to overread anger. You don't, your brain doesn't take chances. It says angry and you change your behavior, you adapt to that. Um, so that's, this is very adaptive when you're in an environment where being sensitive to anger, overreading it is important. It's very maladaptive when you're in a regular school environment and you walk down the hall and somebody walking in the other direction, looks at you with a neutral face, and you see an angry face, and you feel threatened, and you strike out to protect yourself. So the, the message from both of these slides is that early experiences are shaping the development of the architecture of the brain, the circuitry and its responses, in anticipation of optimally adapting to the environment. And when the environment is threatening or dangerous, the brain adapts in a way that works in that circumstance, but may set you up for maladaptive ways of seeing things or behaving in the future, not to mention set you up for being more likely to get illnesses and more likely to not live as long as people who've had uh, a, more, so, a more predictable and stable and, and safe early experience. So I will stop here, um, just kind of present some basic principles to you. I will pass 
the torch to Josh Buckholz, and we'll move to the next presentation. Hi, I'm Josh Buckholz. It is a sincere pleasure to be here today um, because I am among my people. I'm among nerds. There, in most other audiences, I would be the only one who would think that it would be the coolest thing in the world to be in the Museum of Science after hours. Um, but here, I, I, I have the sense that that feeling is shared. Um, so, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, I knew I would. <laughs> so, the, what I'm gonna talk about today is, is the biology of, of self-control, and in particular, poor self-control. How we get brains that do a very poor job at putting the brakes on behavior when that's what's called for. But I'll start by asking each of you a simple question, but it is in fact a deceptively simple question, and that is, what's stopping you? What's stopping you from eating that second piece of red velvet cake? What's stopping you? Oh, what's stopping you from ducking out after my talk and grabbing a smoke or two or three? What's stopping you? What's stopping you from <laughs> cheating on your boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife with an attractive stranger that you meet at a bar this weekend? What's stopping you? And what's stopping you and you and you and especially you and me <laughs> from doing everything that deep down in the darkest parts of our greedy little selves we truly want to do, right? I mean. Red velvet cake is delicious. <laughs> it's incontrovertible scientific evidence, and I'm a scientist. <laughs> Smoking feels great. It's very reinforcing. And if the Craigslist personals ads uh, are any indication, extramarital sex is a very popular activity. So what's stopping us? Well, for one thing, we can make predictions. We're really good at that. Human beings are phenomenal at making predictions. We can make predictions about the, the likely negative outcomes of some action, and then we can bring that information to bear when it comes time to make our choice. For example, we know that choosing to smoke is likely to have some significant negative consequences for our health and our appearance, and self-control failures in other domains can have other awkward consequences. And for most of us, when we make this, this prediction, this calculation where we weigh the costs against the rewards of a particular choice, and this happens, mind you, in just the merest of split seconds, these representations of long-term consequences change the value that we place on an action. And this enables us to, to put the brakes on our behavior even when we're faced with exceptionally tantalizing short-term rewards. And so what's stopping us? Well. It's a capacity that we can call, for lack of a better word, uh, self-control. And there are some reasons why cognitive scientists, when we talk about self-control, we do it with a wink and a nod, because self-control is actually you know, a, a number of distinct but kind of related cognitive processes that I won't go into right now. So self-control is this fundamental capacity that enables adaptive human behavior. It's really important, and unfortunately, some of us lack it. Highly impulsive people, people who lack self-control, they consistently make rash, destructive decisions that put their health, their safety, and yes, even their lives in great danger. And these folks are at significantly greater risk for a range of mental illnesses, of forms of psychopathology, in particular drug addiction and antisocial anti personality disorder. And though these folks, mind you, are, are a relative minority in the population, they're responsible for literally trillions of dollars every year in costs related to treatment and incarceration and opportunity costs and lost productivity. So trillions of dollars that all stems from this deficient capacity for self-control. So how do we get these differences in the first place? Well, one thing that we know, and this is the sort of bedrock of neuroscience, is that everything that we are, we are because of our brains. Every blush of malice and every bite of conscience, every rush of joy and every slow bloom of sadness, every act of generation, and every movement towards destruction, all of it, all of it, arises from the coherent firing of neurons. 
And so individual differences in behavior must in turn arise from individual differences in the way that our brains function. And this begs another question, of course, it's how do we get variability in brains? And this part too is maddeningly simple. We get differences in brains from differences in the genes that we're born with and the environments that we're exposed to. And I'll now give two brief examples of how genes and environments can predispose poor self-control by affecting the way that our brains work. And this part of our story takes us to a rather unlikely place. It's a beautiful village in southern Holland. And it would be a, a wonderful place to visit, except for the fact that members of a rather large family in this Dutch village had been absolutely terrorizing its citizenry for years. And not just a, a few years, mind you, but for 10 generations, literally hundreds of years. This family, or really the men of this family, were absolutely notorious. You can actually, this is true, look back through the town's uh, historical records and you can see them mentioned hundreds of times stretching back to the 19th century. And these men were not, mind you, uh, receiving the keys to the city. No, the f men in this family were well known because they were, to put it bluntly, some of the most violent SOBs you would never hope to meet. These men were chronically antisocial. They committed assaults and rapes and arson and exhibitionism and murder. These were unbelievably violent people. And why they behaved this way and why they, they propagated from generation after generation was unknown until sometime in the 1990s when a geneticist named Han Brunner had the bright idea of examining their DNA. And when Han Brunner sequenced the X chromosome in this family, he found that all of the violent men had the same genetic abnormality, something called a premature stop mutation in a gene called MAOA which stands for monoamine oxidase A. And this mutation essentially knocked out the function of the gene in this man. And this provided the first ever demonstration of a specific genetic link to violence, aggression, and impulsivity. Now, this mutation, I should say, this, this human MAOA knockout produces a really dramatic change in biology, and so it's not entirely surprising that it has dramatic effects on behavior. But fortunately for us, it's also extremely rare. No one outside of that family has that particular mutation. But that doesn't mean that everyone's MAOA gene is the same. In fact, this gene comes in two versions a high-functioning version and a low-functioning version. And if we were to sequence the genome of everyone in this room, we'd find that about 60% of us have the, the very active version and about 40% of us have the lazy version of this gene. And so some of the research that I've done is to try and figure out what having different versions of this gene does to our brains. And when we measure brain function, in folks who have the, the relatively less active, the lazy version of this gene, the relationship between MAOA and violence begins to make a little sense. Because one thing that having the, this version of the gene does is it, it weakens a brain circuit that turns out to be really important for regulating emotional responses and behavior. First, we know that because when we show people in the study pictures of things that are really unpleasant or threatening, a part of the brain called the amygdala just ramps up its activity. In the people who have the lower functioning version of this gene, their amygdala activity goes absolutely through the roof. The amygdala functions sort of like an early warning system for the rest of the brain. It alerts it to something in the world that it really needs to pay attention to because it might affect an organism's survival. Amygdala activation is kind of like stepping on the gas, motivating an organism to deal with something that's really important out there in the world. And second, when we give our research participants a task, pretty simple task, where they need to put the brakes on their behavior, in this case they have to stop themselves from pressing a button whenever they see an arrow that's surrounded by X's. People with the less effective version of this gene show lower activity in a part of the brain that Jack talked about, the prefrontal cortex. And we know that the prefrontal cortex is really important for exerting what we call executive control. That is, making the most adaptive decision in any given moment based on the most updated representation about the state of the world. So in sum, people with the less effective version of this gene have a pattern of brain activity that produces relatively stronger emotional responses to things that are unpleasant or threatening coupled with a weaker ability to put the brakes on their behavior when it's required. 
And when we look at the structure of their brains, we can see why they have these functional differences. These people, on average, have much less gray matter volume in this exact same circuitry for emotional arousal and regulation. And so the take-home point from these slides is that people with the less effective version of MAOA have functional and structural changes in a key brain circuit for emotion regulation. But the big question is, does it matter? <laughs> does it really matter? Right? Do, do having these changes matter? Does having one version or the other of the, this particular gene matter? And the answer, thank God, is absolutely not. Because as I mentioned, 40% of us in this room are sitting there with, deep inside our genomes, this lower functioning version of the gene. So on its own, having the low functioning version doesn't really mean anything. Our brains can do a perfectly fine job of compensating. Right? 40% of you uh, here tonight have it, and, and you know, to the best of my understanding, almost none of you are violent psychopaths. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing. When you combine this version with a really bad environment, well, that actually is not such good news. And this chart here is actually data from the same cohort that Jack mentioned, this Dunedin study. And they showed really striking evidence for what we call a gene by environment interaction. Here you can see that absent a bad environment, having the low functioning version of the gene does nothing to increase risk for adult antisocial behavior. But when you take the people with the low functioning version and you expose them to more and more childhood abuse, their risk for violence as an adult jumps dramatically. On the other hand, the folks with the, the higher version, the higher functioning version of the gene, well, they also show somewhat greater propensity towards violence, but to a much smaller degree. But in some ways, this is just telling us what we've already known for about 40 years, which is that something about being exposed to childhood maltreatment changes the way that we behave as adults. In the case of childhood abuse, some people have called it the cycle of violence. So we know that uh, you know, the abused boy often grows up to be the abusing man. What we don't know is why. And so to fill in this piece of the puzzle, we looked at brain chemistry and a sample of volunteers who come from very different childhood backgrounds, including some people who were exposed to rather significant childhood abuse. And we found that adults who had experienced abuse as children had significantly higher levels of, re of a receptor for a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Right? But it only was elevated in two places. Can you guess where? It was the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, right? the exact regions where we saw an effect of the MAOA gene. And so I'm going to leave you all tonight with a very complicated figure and a simple saying. And the complicated figure is just telling us that for most people, the effect of any one gene on behavior is going to be so small as to be essentially insignificant. Genetic variation shapes neural variation, certainly, but the impact of genetically driven brain changes have a, have a limit. But these brain changes may make people more susceptible to the effects of a bad environment because the impact of bad genes and bad environments seems to converge on a critical brain circuit for emotional arousal and inhibitory control. Or in other words, when it comes to violence, gun, uh, genes load the gun, but it's the environment that pulls the trigger. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, this, that's all I got. I just want to highlight the people in my lab who make all this stuff possible, and my collaborators at Vanderbilt and at the National Institutes of Mental Health. Thank you. Oh, oh, wait. It is now my deep and, and sincere pleasure to be able to introduce Jessica. Well, it's great to be here. Wow, it is hard to see you all. Um, I didn't realize how blinding this would be. I work on terrorism and uh, so I, I work on people who are violent, and people have asked, why is it we still can't answer the question, what leads a person to become a terrorist? Especially since 9-11, when money has really poured into the field. Uh, why are we still so puzzled? And what would we need to do to try to answer this question? The first thing to recognize is that most of the money that is poured into the field 
has gone into the development of databases that are based on press reporting. And these data make it possible to answer some questions about terrorism. For example, looking at the data, a graduate student and I were able to show that tactics that were developed in Iraq after our invasion uh, spread to Afghanistan. It's, it's easy to see that. You can see when they started in Iraq and you can see when they ended up in Afghanistan. So that includes suicide bombing and also vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices. Uh, the data that are available to scholars also make it relatively easy to address, uh, to assess risk factors at the level of societies or groups. So we, we can't identify what some people have called root causes of terrorism, but we can uh, identify some correlations. So data that, that we now have enable us to address the question, is democracy a panacea for terrorism? Should we be spreading democracy if our aim is to reduce the threat of terrorism? Well, it turns out the answer to that question is absolutely no. Indeed, democracy, it, the, the, the transition from autocratic rule to democracy is a particularly risky moment in terms of terrorism. So it probably has exactly the opposite effect of what we would like to see. What about lack of education? That's a risk factor at the level of, well, actually individuals and societies uh, that was mentioned early on after 9-11. No, uh, there is no correlation between lack of education and terrorism or support for terrorism. And indeed, uh, researchers like Alberto Abadi, who's an econometrician at Kennedy School, and Alan Kruger at Princeton have shown that support for terrorism is, uh, actually this is work by Kruger, I apologize, I got the wrong citation there, uh, that more highly educated people tend to be more supportive of terrorism in certain countries such as Lebanon. Uh, what about uh, the idea that terrorists come get trained in religious, extremist religious schools, madrasas. Well, early on, it does seem that uh, terrorists in Pakistan were being recruited from madrasas. But more recently, it appears that they're not being recruited from these schools. Um, here are some risk factors that appear to, to be genuine at the level of societies. High male to female ratios is a risk factor for internal war or terrorism. Uh, I guess um, we, well, I'll, I'll just tell you that in Saudi Arabia, where they have a very significant uh, rehab program for terrorists, what they do, one of the things they do to rehabilitate a terrorist or reintegrate a terrorist into society is to find the terrorist a wife. So um, <laughs> it's consistent with that risk factor. By the way, they also uh, get the terrorist a job. They get a job for the terrorist family. They also buy the terrorist a car if he needs one. Um, obviously, not all of these um, remedies can be applied in all societies, in particular finding the terrorist a wife. Not, not exactly something we can replicate everywhere. Um, another risk factor at the level of society, youth bulges. Now what causes youth bulges? Lower levels of female education is correlated with higher levels of fertility. Um, so we know there are two correlations there. We can't necessarily say that low levels of female education leads to terrorism. Uh, military occupation has been shown to be a risk factor in particular for suicide terrorism. Uh, some of my colleagues have found that sacred values are a risk factor. Uh, 
And there's, of course, a big debate among scholars. What are the most important risk factors? Uh, is religion at all important, content of religion? Uh, I'm on the side of, of saying that it, it, it's actually less important. Um, people have also been able to show that individuals get drawn into terrorist groups through a social network without necessarily even knowing what the group stands for. They may even get drawn, especially far-right neo-Nazi terrorists, may get drawn in through a social network because they're attracted to symbols and music. Music turns out to be a very interesting entry point for neo-Nazis and skinheads. And fascinatingly, some Islamist terrorists use what's called jihad rap. Uh, to recruit on, on the internet. Two doctoral students at Cornell have been able to show that uh, suicide bombing spreads when to, to countries where there's a higher level of collectivism. There's a scale of collectivism uh, that social scientists are, are increasingly using. And it appears that societies that are more collectivist are more prone to catching this disease of suicide terrorism. The idea is that people feel the need to act on behalf of others, even to the point of risking their lives, even to the point of murdering, uh, more so in collectivist societies. And another study, uh, again, using these large end data that have been uh, funded um, counterintuitively, support for liber liberal democratic values was positively correlated with support for militant groups in Pakistan. But none of these studies, making use of these very expensive data that are now available, help us really look at the level of individuals. What, how would we study that question? What if we wanted to find both the perhaps genetic predispositions or upbringing or very importantly political situations? What, if we wanted to find how those different levels combine to create a terrorist? And I, I think there's no question uh, that when we get there it will be a combination of factors at different levels. Uh, what we would need to do is first develop a list of putative risk factors at the level of individuals, and then test them against controls. How do we get those putative risk factors at the level of individuals? Well, we can't get them from correlation studies. We actually have to go and collect data from individuals. We have to go and talk to terrorists, and that's what I do. I go out, I, I spent a lot of time in Pakistan uh, prior to 9-11. I became, uh, I was told, the best known Westerner among the Mujahideen in Pakistan. Uh, after 9-11, I decided that was not a good thing. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was, I'm actually at least as worried about Pakistan's intelligence agencies, who all have different ideas about whether I should have been doing what I was doing. Um, I, was, I was worried about them, at least as, I, as much as I was about the Mujahideen. But I still do this research, and I do it in prisons. And so I'm just going to tell you uh, very briefly about my most recent interview of a terrorist. I've also been interviewing war criminals in prison, but I'll tell you about one guy. And it, it will show you how... Uh, difficult it is to come up with these risk factors to test. Um, because if we try to find the terrorist mind, as a, a colleague of mine put it, Jeff Vickdorf, he's a psychiatrist and a neurologist, we, we are going to find, there's no one terrorist mind. There are many terrorist minds. And so I'm going to tell you a story uh, that, it, because this guy's so unusual, I think you'll, you'll see. Um, it's so different from any other terrorist you know about. Uh, you'll see 
that we cannot draw conclusions from a small, small n about what causes terrorism in general. So this person was adopted. Uh, he grew up, he was adopted into a part of Sweden that is all white. And this person has brown skin. And he was, as a child, I, I, he was abused. Um, he was beaten. And this word beaten is the same word that he used to describe torturing people in Bosnia. Uh, he said, I beat them. He broke limbs and so on. I don't think any of his limbs were broken, but his attorney also told me that, that he was quite abused. Um, he has brown skin. He's in an all-white area of Sweden. And he becomes very attracted to Nazis because he liked the way they marched in columns. And he liked their uniforms. And he was, he, he was trained. He, was, uh, he had to be a, a soldier for a brief period. But Sweden was not at war. And he was very disappointed. He said, look, I, I was trained. I wanted to be a fighter. And he said, fortunately, he found out that he would be able to fight for Croatia in Bosnia. And he was very excited also by the Croatians' link, um, the Ustasha, with the Nazis. And he was allowed to, to wear a swastika. It was fine. Uh, and he told me that he, d he loved to kill people. And he exp his theory of terrorism is that people who become terrorists love to kill, and the ideology is secondary. Now, I completely disagree with his theory of terrorism, and I told him that. But he was describing himself. There are some people who become terrorists for that reason. Uh, I think most are not like that. Um, he then became recruited to a Nazi group, and he has he, he will be in prison. He, he has life imprisonment. He, he got life. But he will be in prison, most likely, for 21 years and returned uh, to ordinary life. And he's undergoing a reintegration program now. And that's how I got access to him. He talked to me over two days. And uh, he, he now believes that he has given up this desire to kill people, although he said he realizes that he is, uh, he feels castrated now that he's given up this desire to kill people. So why did this guy talk to me? Terrorists talk because they're lonely, because they want people to understand why they do what they do. They want people to understand their ideology. And some, especially in the beginning, are very much motivated by the ideology, despite what this particular terrorist, my most latest interview, told me. Um, in this case, this terrorist insisted on reading a couple of my books. And I believe that one of the reasons he talked to me uh, is because he read about my personal experience of having been raped. And I was raped at gunpoint at the age of 15. Uh, and here I'm bringing us back to the experience uh, of, uh, this is not early childhood, but a childhood crisis. Um, my father, who was a victim, uh, was a refugee from Nazi Germany, did not come back when he heard, he was on a business trip, he heard from our family doctor, that his two daughters had just been raped at gunpoint. And he thought it would be most efficient to finish his business trip. Um, and so he didn't come back. So I had this very traumatic experience. And I didn't have a parent there. My mother was dead. And I, I will just say that um, I believe that this experience the whole experience, including being brought up by a refugee from Nazi Germany, 
and the, the unstated horror of what my father experienced had a profound effect on my choice of career and also my ability to, to sit down and talk to violent men, my deep curiosity about violence. Um, and I'm, it's very hard for me to bring together these two sides of, of what I write about, <laughs> but I was asked to do that. So I'm, I'm just going to stop there, and, and um, we can talk about it more in questions as, if it's of interest. So I will, why don't you all come up, and we can have a conversation. <clears throat> First, thank you, Jessica and Jack and Josh, for very, very um, exciting, uh, exhilarating, and, and truly thought-provoking presentations. And as you just said, Jessica, I mean, they, what unifies them is the issue of violence. And I, I would like to maybe start the conversation here by asking a question. On the surface, one may ask, as Jessica just alluded to, is how does terrorism relate to toxic uh, childhood experience or to the shaping of the brain as one relates to um, fear and self-control? And certainly the common theme here is violence. I mean, when you think of terrorism, terrorism is just a title on acts of, of violence. And there seems to be a lot of different potential reasons why people resort to violence, whatever we call it. <coughs> Um, but one common theme I've seen here is not only that potentially individuals, no matter where they live in any context, could resort to violence based on early childhood exposure, particularly to very deep trauma and sustained trauma. But what I just heard you say, Jessica, is that people who have been uh, exposed to trauma can take a different path. So rather than committing acts of violence, they could try to understand why people commit acts of violence. So it goes to the point of almost not so much plasticity, but that we do have a choice. And, and so my question, and maybe start with, with Jack. I mean, Jessica not only experienced horrendous trauma at a young age, but she, did she potentially, maybe this is a question for Josh, um, genetically inherit a sense of fear and trauma based on her father's experience and in the Second World War in Germany. But really, the question of this sort of choice almost, and again, I'm speaking as a non-scientist, but let me throw that out there. I'm glad we're starting with an easy question so we can go on to the more <laughs> challenging ones later. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, oh my God, there are so many questions embedded in what you just said, Tim. So I'll, I'll just make a few brief comments and just like blow it out for conversation. Um, so for starters, uh, so I, don't, I, don't, I think what most scientists would say to your first question is, uh, you know, we have absolutely no idea how to answer that question. <laughs> uh, it's not even remotely within the realm of our ability to answer that for the following reasons. Um, and I'll channel some of the other things that were said. So um, there, there are some basic principles of biology that are becoming increasingly clear um, that are relevant to this at 15,000 feet. Like, for all of the things we've been talking about tonight, none of that is hardwired in the genes that, that would allow you to predict anything. Um, and yet, everything is the result of gene-environment interaction. And um, if you really pin down, as I have many times, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I work with a lot of really smart neuroscientists, and I'm always um, interested in how to extract not the, um, all of the details, but principles that could help us respond to some of these questions. And the classic answer from a neuroscientist on everything is we're just beginning to scratch the top tip of the surface, and we really don't understand anything. 
but when you when you want to step back as some of the stuff that I presented um, to me, and these are concepts that all the neuroscientists say, oh yeah, well we all agree on that, is that early experience is kind of built into your brain and it affects your behavior. But then we have this annoying little, well, annoying or delightful, depending upon your perspective, little fact that are called individual differences, which is that a lot of what we know from correlational studies and epidemiologic research is what we can extract from populations and, and risk factors. And the problem is when you talk about that, and I can't see anybody out there, but nobody should go home tonight. And if somebody says, well, what did you learn? To say, well, I learned that, um, well, what were some of, some of those really intriguing things that you said? They all went by very quickly. Pick one risk. I learned that there's an associate. I learned that one way to rehabilitate a terrorist is to get him a wife. Right? Um, even though that might have come out in one of the analyses, right? Because that doesn't help. That doesn't tell us anything about what causes things. It doesn't tell us anything about how it happens underneath. And, and the one thing, I'm already rambling on too much, so I'll pass the mic, but I would beg everybody not to leave here and go home and tell any friend that you'd learn some interesting things tonight about how children who experience um, maltreatment um, are, are likely to grow up to be terrorists because um, very uh, an infinitesimally small percentage of individuals who are maltreated become terrorists or serial murderers or any other thing. But um, a very high percentage of people who do terrible things of a violent nature when they're older, very few of them were like fine until one day they grew up, they got woke up as an adult and, and were experiencing really serious antisocial behavior. So this is complicated stuff. The neuroscience is trying to figure it out at a molecular level. Um, the correlational studies are trying to get a handle on well, how could we predict who's at high risk for something, but they're, they're dangerous studies to kind of draw conclusions from because they feed into that thing that everybody knows about, you know, the, the, late, the study du jour in the paper. People say, gee, I just read last month that coffee is not good for you when you're pregnant. And then somebody says, that's funny. Three months ago, I read a study that said there's nothing wrong with coffee when you're pregnant, but don't eat tuna fish. And, and that, that's, not, that's not our knowledge base. Those are, those are exploratory ways of trying to figure out what's associated with what. And in the end, it's the cause and effect that we're trying to understand. And the cause and effect is a probability. It's not a deterministic so statement can I just because add of individual here differences. About this, um, uh, you know, one of the risk factors that seems to me quite valid, based on many, many interviews, is humiliation. But I also need to say that most people are humiliated, and indeed, I was a junior faculty member at Harvard, and I would it's say all the time. exactly. I would say that Harvard is a humiliation factory, and yet it does not produce many terrorists. As they're real <laughs> until they get tenured. Yeah. Um, as a as a neuroscientist, I feel compelled to say that we're just beginning to scratch the surface, <laughs> <laughs> and we really don't know anything. Um, you know what I took away from Jessica's presentation is something that has struck me uh, in almost every area of science, which is that the categories that we have don't do a very good job of informing us about the underlying mechanisms of how the people who typify those categories were created. So people with mental illness, that's an incredibly heterogeneous category. There are many different pathways to different forms of mental illness, and similarly, and this is something that I have really hadn't thought about until Jessica's presentation, there are, there's a similar kind of heterog heterogeneity among terrorists. And so what Jessica is doing in, in the, these sort of very deep vertical analyses of individuals is trying to figure out, you know, what is the landscape there? You know, the, the, uh, the label of a terrorist is meaningless. It's just a particular behavior. It doesn't tell you anything about what generated that behavior and what caused the, the changes in information processing and, and uh, you know, emotional sensibility that, that led someone to make those decisions. Yeah, let, me, let me just add another, a couple of points about this all around one issue, which is that um, to get to this notion of what's the underlying common factor here, so I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not an expert in mental illness, but uh, with little I know about these things, to me, one obviously core feature of terrorism is a profound um, dysfunction of the capacity for empathy, right? I mean, you can't, you can't 
feel a sense of empathy for people and kill people without feeling it, right? So there's a profound problem there. Now, um, there are a couple of ways to think about this. So what are the circuits in the brain involved in empathy? I mean, I, I'll defer to Josh on that. My guess is people have some good ideas and also are not quite sure. Um, we could ask questions about, you know, what happened, how do those parts of the brain develop? But still, there's an issue of a common feature that doesn't, that shouldn't be mistaken as, so there's a magic bullet for what makes terrorists, um, because there are all kinds of terrorists, right? And, and so you described a number of terrorists. There are, there are clearly people who commit acts of terrorism who are, who are psychotic. There are clearly people who commit acts of terrorism who are not psychotic, but at least by my definition, not as a mental health professional, a person who wantonly kills people is mentally ill. Now that, there's, there's something profoundly wrong with the way the brain is working there. And all of these things have to do with the brain. But I think the biggest danger is for us to kind of move toward um, a kind of a pop psychology about these things from either end, either from a description of a type or say, oh, yeah, I heard about this circuit in the, that connects the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex, which is actually a circuit that's very, very important in terms of how threat affects thinking. But um, the question of what do we do with that, um, does it really help us understand what's going on? See, that my interest is how do we take the best knowledge we have and figure out what we should be doing uh, to prevent bad things from happening, for to get development back on track when it goes off track. Um, um, and that's where far away from having definitive answers, but the science could give us good insights into what we might try to do differently from what we've been doing in the past. That's the exciting frontier is to not just keep doing the same old things, but try to get smarter. And I think all this work is a good example of different ways of people trying to figure this out. But it's really complicated. And we're in big trouble when people kind of have, when someone with initials after his or her name you know, is on the TV screen and telling us exactly what this is all about, because it's not. The people who did 9-11, I don't know about all of them, but the leaders had, high, had college degrees. They, were, they had advanced education. Um, the, um, Saddam Hussein's right arm is a physician from Egypt. This is not just poverty. It has not just kind of lack of education. Um, it's very complicated. People are all different. Um, but I think Josh, you want to say something? Or? No. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I, I meant Osama bin Laden. Did yeah. I say Osama, Osama bin Laden? Uh, b before we go to questions from the audience, which we assume is out there somewhere. Uh, uh, yeah. Sure. Oh, we're not alone. Hey, look at you guys. I just want to say a couple of things. I mean, obviously, when you look at the title, there's all great risk, particularly when you, you're dealing with really leaders in science who are trying to get to the, to the granular, granular aspects of the brain and, and human experience. Um, but the, the other common um, dynamic in this is not just violence. I think you touched upon it. It's about emotion. And it's to recognize that emotions are wired in the brain as well as co cognition. And emotions of anger or fear of, of the experience of humiliation um, those play fundamentally important roles in our behavior as individuals. And I'll say one last thing before we go to questions, and you mentioned 9-11. And I remember I was uh, moderating a panel here in Cambridge at an event that uh, Swanee Hunt did on women from around the world, and it happened a month after the 9-11 attacks. And there were two or three people just saying, you know, how did these individuals do this? Why did they commit this act of terrorism? How they, you know, killed so many people? And there were these students from Lowell and Lawrence, Mass, from really blue collar uh, neighborhoods who were sitting in the back. And finally, one of them raised their hand and said, you know what, I know why they did that. Because they were humiliated. They were angry. And I remember just sitting there thinking, you know, forget it's the title of terrorist. Forget the fact that this is an American or somebody from another country in the Middle East. These were humans. And these young people growing up here in Massachusetts understood on an emotional level why people can commit acts of violence. And it's not to justify it, but to recognize that this is a shared human experience. 
And to your points, we really don't know and we can't explain why people do what they do. We are certainly learning how toxic environments can shape the brain. It's exciting to learn that the brain can be uh, examined now in ways and see the circuitry and see how we as a species are very much driven by what happens in the brain, as Josh said. So, I mean, I think that's one of the key things I think we'd want to take away from this, is that this is an early uh, period in this, and really in this revolution of science. We're going down this path, and it's going to really give us information about what it is to be human that will be really powerful, and I think liberating in the future. So with that, were there any questions? Uh, first question here. <clears throat> Well, thank you. I enjoyed this, but I would like to ask a question on one small aspect. And that is, you use the word terrorist as people who want to kill people. And I would like to ask how you deal with people who are so supportive of capital punishment and for the individuals who work for prisons who just get a salary for murdering people who are brought into them who did something several years earlier. But it seems to me as though these people don't object to killing or they wouldn't be voting for capital punishment or hiring themselves out to do it. I'll just say that I, I uh, oppose capital punishment and I in particular oppose it for terrorists. I mean, I oppose it across the board, but I think it's, uh, it's not useful uh, to protect national security when it comes to terrorists. Well, I, you know, I, I think, thank you for your question. It's a really important one, I think, because um, I, the more I get into conversations like this, the more I feel like the correct answer is that we have no idea what's going on with a lot of these things. I, I really mean that. I Just to, in terms of what you said, Tim, and I agree, humiliation to me sounds like a pretty powerful motivation and it seems to be a common feature, but but so few people who are humiliated, you know, kill wantonly. And I, I think, you know, there's some classic psychological experiments uh, done in prisons. By, and there was a famous study done at Stanford, a classic psychology experiment that's a big part of the usual ethics uh, discussions about students who were asked to role play prisoners and guards and they, to see what that experience is like. And they had to stop the experiment within a week because the students who were asked to play the roles of guards were so brutal to the students who were asked to play the roles of prisoners that it was, it was un, unbearable to continue the experiment. So this capacity for, um, for destruction and this capacity that's part of our character, I don't, I don't even remotely know how to begin to understand that, but there's a dark side to uh, behavior that I think we don't understand. Um, we can come up with a lot of um, traits that are associated with extremes, but there are always lots of exceptions to the rule. And something like capital punishment it brings up another interesting issue, which is ideology, right? So sometimes ideology um, kind of uh, makes, ex makes acceptable some things that in other cases would not be acceptable, like state-sanctioned murder. Um, I'll never forget, it was the first anniversary of 9-11, and, and Frontline ran uh, had a special, and um, it was chilling. I'll never forget this. They had a series of people they were interviewing, one of whom was a clergyman who said, as soon as I heard about this attack before I knew anything about it, I said to myself, this must have been done in the name of religion, because only in the name of religion do people sometimes commit these kinds of acts of brutality. It's really chilling, but each of these is an anecdote, right? And none of them really tell us what the answer is. So I think we could go on and on with those issues. It's really important. It has to do with the capacity to take someone's life and not feel any remorse about that, feel justified in some way. It's, um, it's pretty striking. Okay, the next question's over here. I feel like the issue of gender difference has not been adequately addressed here. Not exclusively, but overwhelmingly terrorists are male. And if you look at acts of violence, you also get significant gender differences. Would any of you like to comment on this or on the role, say, of testosterone in this issue? <laughs> any of you guys? <laughs> well, one thing that is interesting in considering gender differences, so, all right, we have this genetic variation in this gene MAOA that I was talking about. And on its own, we know that it's not particularly important for deterministically you know, deciding the outcome that someone, uh, the, the trajectory that someone goes on. 
But it is interesting to note that that gene is on the X chromosome. And you know, men have one X chromosome and women have two. And so there is a way to compensate in women if one of those X chromosomes carries a less effective version of that gene. So that's just a piece of data. I do with it what you will. Um, you know, as far as the influence of testosterone in, in violence, all sex hormones influence the way that we process emotions and the way that we perceive other people's intentions. Um, you know, testosterone certainly, but you, know, you have testosterone in women too, and you have estrogen in men. So it is, while you know, one might want to be able to draw those kinds of direct links, the actual biology being complicated complicates our ability to simplify uh, these kinds of stories. I'm an academic, so I get paid by the word. Um, <laughs> And uh, probably could have said that in about five words or less. I mean, I'll respond in one sentence. This is like the mother of all gene environment interaction issues, right? There, are, there is clear that there's, there are genetic differences between males and females. It's also clear that gender is highly uh, socialized and constructed. And, and boys and girls are socialized differently. And, and who knows how that all plays out. But there's no question about the gender differences. Is it biological? Sure. Is it environmental? Sure. Um, it's, and who knows how that plays out. It's, and, it's, and it's horrible. Well, I certainly don't. Uh. Next question here. Okay. Um, I first want to thank Dr. Uh, Shankov for his remarks about trying new and different things uh, so that the uh, science might uh, be made better. Uh, my question revolves around that. I've been reading uh, articles lately about a fairly new science called optogenetics. And if I get this right, um, the way I visualize it is you splice in a gene to some nerve cells that are either lazy or even dead uh, that, that are going to produce a fluorescent pigment. Then you activate that pigment, and all of a sudden you wake up lazy neurons, or you make them more functional again. Um, is this a new and promising way to treat the hurting brain? The short answer is no. Um, <laughs> but only because what it requires is something that currently is very far beyond not only our technical abilities, but also, also our, our ethical <laughs> sensibilities, which is genetic engineering in humans. So optogenetics, you're absolutely right. The, the basis of optogenetics is splicing a gene into, or rather, you know, a gene that expresses a protein that goes inside of a neuron that's responsive to light. When you shine a particular frequency of light, the protein that isn't naturally found in that particular neuronal cell turns on or shuts off, depending on the frequency of the light. The critical step, though, is introducing via genetic engineering that new protein that's responsive to light into that set of neurons. And we can do this well in mice. We can, you know, uh, I think we can do it in, in rats. Um, you know, but uh, looking at you, you know, you seem more complicated than mice and rats. And I would be concerned about uh, splicing things into your genome. There's, there's another interesting frontier area. I mean, we're far away from the application, but uh, to Cow Hench, who I spoke at the last session here, is one of the pioneers in this area of research, which relates to this notion of critical and sensitive periods in development and plasticity. We know, as a general rule, that the younger you are, the more adaptable and flexible your brain is, so-called plasticity. It's a sad fact. You know, this is the older you get, the less adaptable your brain is. Um, and for some areas of development, there are critical or sensitive periods where, um, where the impact of experience on gene expression is particularly powerful. And then once that period passes, it's much harder to change. And in critical periods, impossible to change. Well, not anymore. Um, this, again, is animal research. This is the cow's work, work, uh, work in rodents that's shown that even in the visual areas, which was the mother of all critical periods that you just had, a period in which you had to have visual input for those tracks to develop, actually is found in mature mice that you can reopen 
what were felt to be immutable critical periods. And it's because a critical period, rather than we used to think it just kind of things shut down and it was gone forever. No, there were some molecular breaks that were put on um, these circuits. And if you could release the breaks, the circuits would go, would be amenable to change. So what's amazing about this is that everybody understands, we're not that far from Kendall Square, right? Everybody understands that huge amounts of money are going into and will be made from mobilizing molecular biology to have new ways to treat disease and that'll knock our socks off. Um, but the same science is sitting here waiting to be used for new ways to think about how to deal with much more complex social and behavioral problems that are rooted in kind of social and economic context. Um, it's not that there's going to be a pill for poverty or a, you know, some injection that'll turn a terrorist into a philanthropist, but, but that but that there are principles of biology and how experience and genes interact that could lead us to have new ways of thinking and some hypotheses about what we might do differently in a prevention way for people who are living in incubators for violence and in a treatment way for people who have already committed it. This is where I think there's just such huge possibility as opposed to just kind of using 19th and 20th century science to try to keep figuring this out. I mean, I'm a neuroscientist, so any interest in the brain is just is good for business. Um, but I do always feel the need to say that, despite the fact that, you know, genetic engineering and gene-based approaches have a sort of inherent sexiness to them, it's much easier, as it turns out, to change the environments that people are in. It's not easy, but it is relatively easier to change people's environments. And because we know that environments change the way that brains are wired, there is, it is confusing to me that there isn't more interest in using some of the money that we have that goes towards brain research into the epidemiological research and the intervention research that, that you know, Jack has been involved with. Because if you're looking for something that is going to be effective, it, it, it's going to be the environment. Changing people's environments is going to change the way that their brains are wired and it's going to change their behavior. Period. Full stop. Do you want to comment on that? I'd like to say, do you want to comment on that? So at, at the risk of taking the opposite position, um, <laughs> just to get the conversation going, there's an irony here, I think. Um, so in the old days, in the 20th century, the kind of you know, nature versus nurture environment, that was code for if it's genetics, there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> if it's in the environment, we can fix it. And, um, and I think to a certain extent, I mean, that's maybe flipped on its head. Um, because um, at least one could equally make the argument, it's a horrible thing to say, but we're not that far away, I think, from saying it's easier to change the genes than it is to change the environment. Um, and that because there'll be all kinds of uh, techniques and manipulations to whether it's some of the techniques of putting things into genes or figuring out how to release some of the breaks or this whole field of epigenetics where you know one methyl group gets put on a piece of the chromosome and it stops a gene from its expression and if you can somehow release that, the gene will work and if it doesn't. So meanwhile, we struggle to say, how do we improve neighborhoods? How do we improve society? How do we deal with some of these deeply rooted structural inequities? This is the irony. I think um, our track record for knowing how to change the environment, at least on a population basis, hasn't been that great. And pretty soon, the competition is gonna get rougher and rougher for people who are gonna say, Forget all this environment manipulation. I've got a genetic manipulation answer for you. And that's a little bit scary, right? Because there'll be a lot, there'll be a slippery slope where people say, great, we don't know how to end poverty, but you know, come up with the anti-poverty pill to protect kids from the adversities of po or exposure to violence. So I think it's interesting how this might be flipping on its head because changing the environment is actually very difficult. Oh, I'll give one example of uh, why. And I'm not advocating. Of, of, the other of way. why this nightmare scenario of yours won't come true <laughs> <laughs> anytime soon. And it's the, the case of Parkinson's disease. So, Parkinson's disease arises because of a cell death of dopamine neurons in an area of the brain called the midbrain. And so, people had the really smart idea of, well, you know, can't we just sort of grow dopamine neurons and then put them? 
in the midbrain. Explant them there. And it seems like, oh my God, it's, it's the most straightforward genius idea in the world, right? We just, it's a, this is classic science, right? We just, we, here's the thing that's broken. We have that thing, it's not broken over here. Let's put the thing that's not broken over here in the place that it's broken and we'll cure Parkinson's. And that was in the early 90s. Yeah. And um, it's been done, it just doesn't work very well. And the, the, the longer I'm a scientist, talking about humiliation, the longer I'm a scientist, the more humbled I am by how the complexity of the brain thwarts every good intention and every good idea that we have. So, so, so I'll, <laughs> I've, I've had it just to show that, that it, mature adults can learn new things. So I've had this really steep learning curve in the last three years of learning about how the culture of innovation works. You know, what, how places like Silicon Valley and Kendall Square and the old Bell Labs and all those places are very different from the human service system and the healthcare delivery system and the educational system. And, and one of the keys to places that have breakthrough, I should mention the MIT Media Lab, oh sorry. But, but places, the key to breakthrough innovation is it comes after a long list of failed attempts to try something. It never, it doesn't happen the first time, the second time, or the third time, and certainly science has a wonderful history of people. I love the Watson and Crick story, you know, about how how they were wandering around, but they knew what they were looking for, but then all of a sudden they kind of found it. And Thomas Edison, you know, who I think still has more patents than anybody else, has this great quote of saying, I've never failed at anything, but I've found 10,000 things that don't work. <laughs> so, you know, I really think that there is this issue, and, and the example you gave, Josh, is a great one. So um, I would assume that at some point people will figure that out. And the fact that it's all these years they haven't means the only way they won't figure it out is if they stop trying to figure it out. But if they keep going, they will figure it out. I think we have time for maybe one more question, but I just want to make a point to what Josh was pointing out about environment. That environment may be a cheaper alternative than to your potential suggestion. I'm not suggesting. Oh, yeah. I'm joking. Can I point out how weird this is? Yeah. That I'm a neuroscientist and I'm saying, look at the environment and you know, Jack's a pediatrician, and he's saying, "Look at the." I just, just think it's to, weird. Just to clarify, <laughs> I say I'm not saying don't look in the environment. I'm saying it's harder to change than genetics will be in a few years. Right. I'm not advocating to go for that. But w the reason I was going to mention is we about 15 years ago uh, did a series of programs um, before the Good Friday Peace Agreement was signed in Northern Ireland, where uh, at Harvard we brought over for a week a lot of the key political leaders, including leaders of Sinn Féin IRA and the Protestant paramilitaries, as well as the more traditional political parties. And this is before any peace agreement. These are people who would never meet each other in, in Northern Ireland, which is a very small country. When they arrived, they would meet in different corners. They wouldn't stand in the same coffee line. And then after a day or two or three, their attitude and behavior towards the other started to change. And what I noticed is they kept on looking over their shoulder to see if somebody from their political party was around. Because the, the impact of the group that they belonged to, sort of the dominant group that they belonged to, their social group, had a huge influence on their behavior. And this was in the midst of a conflict with people they really despised, people they, in many cases, had tried to kill or, when they went back home, might support killing. And yet being out of the environment of violence into a new environment that was very different allowed them to start expressing a different behavior and literally using words like, I never thought this person would be as human as he or she appears. So there is something about taking people out of their environment to see them start to open up and become more as an individual than as somebody as part of a group. And I think that's where cognitive science can really help us is to understand not what drives people to political violence or what some would call terrorism, but what are the triggers that allow people to start thinking, oh, this person is human like me. This is a person I could actually make peace with. This is a person I can reconcile with. And I think a lot about taking people out of the environment in which they live. And, and one final um, example is Nelson Mandela and Winnie Mandela. Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in prison, and in the isolation of prison, came out a very different person 
than his wife, Winnie Mandela, who spent 27 years in the social reality of apartheid South Africa. They had very little in common. And so environment shapes people in different ways, but also the group that they're surrounded by, the, the narrative of the community they're, they're surrounded by can have a huge influence on behavior, which could also lead to violence. Okay, um, last question over here. I was very interested in the first talk that Jack gave when you were talking about um, the effects of having a toxic childhood and how the body seems to remember um, the effects of that kind of childhood. Um, I found it very interesting because I had a very toxic childhood. Um, I was beaten several times a day for 10 years. And so that feeling of terror and anger was just constant for a very long period of time. And it seems like there have been two uh, ways in which my body has retained that kind of memory. One is really debilitating back pain to the point where they told me I should just go on disability when I was 22 or 23 years old. It would be so bad that there would be times where I would just stop and lay down in the middle of a busy sidewalk because I just couldn't take it anymore. So there was that aspect of it. And then the other aspect of it was that I would have sometimes very severe depression where the pain in my mind would be so blinding that you would think about suicide once every 30 seconds, or just constantly, um, because nothing could put a dent in that kind of pain. So I noticed this odd phenomenon that something seemed to go back and forth between those two patterns. So when my back was in blinding pain, my mind would be clear and peaceful. Um, I wouldn't really have much problems of anything. And when my mind had this blinding pain in it, my back would be fully functional. And I was wondering, have you ever encountered this phenomenon before in your research? Uh, where can I learn more about this? Because it didn't seem to make any damn sense to me, but I, could, I repeatedly had this experience over and over again that there was this giant ball of pain, and it would either reside in my mind or it would reside in my back. Um, and through meditation, I learned how to dissipate that ball. Uh, but I'd be curious to learn anything you knew about it. <laughs> Wait, actually, can I, just, I will say one thing. Just as a, as a, as a human, I, I'm so sorry that you went through all that, and I'm really glad you're here. So, so I'll add to that um, and elaborate a little bit. Um, so we don't know each other. And I don't know anything about you except what you've just said. And I think there are two powerful principles that your brief story illustrates. One is that although the, the body doesn't forget, and there are memories, everything about biology is trying to get back on track. Right? It's not that biology is always operating in the direction of trying to adapt and trying to get back on track. Um, it's only when we keep pushing it off track that it keeps going off track. So what you're, the positive experiences that you're describing in the shift is, is an example of biology um, wanting to get it right, but having some baggage to carry with it. It's also really dangerous for me to extrapolate from biology to one single human being. So I'm trying to kind of think creatively about it, but it's very dangerous when people look at all this stuff and say, you know, so, so what does that mean for me? Because it's, that's, that's hard. But I would bet, knowing nothing about you, but see, and just listening to you speak, and knowing that you've got a lot of strength, and that you have a lot of adaptability, that whatever horrible experiences you had, there was at least one person in your life who was a tremendously powerful source of support and help that got you to this place. You did not do that entirely on your own with nobody, whether it was someone in the family, someone in the neighborhood, a coach, a teacher, somebody. And this is, I think, a really important message for all of us because um, because there's this, this easy tendency for us to find people who have overcome really difficult like circumstances and say to those who haven't, you know, I says, I says, suck it up and be like, be like that guy in the second row. And even though you have back pain and other things, look at how far he's come. Um, and if I'm wrong, don't say it out loud, come to me personally. <laughs> but I cannot believe that you did that entirely on your own as a child and growing up without people who, yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, I, I said that I agree with you. I've had uh, really good teachers in high school. I had a professor in college. I have had meditation teachers. I've had martial arts teachers. I've had therapists um, that I've sought out at different points in my life. So the brain is looking for that all the time, and when it finds it, it uses it as well as it can, which is why all different kinds of ways of providing that support for children when they're young can kind of save them. It's not, it doesn't have to just be your parent. It doesn't just have to be person. It doesn't have to be a blood relative. The brain doesn't say, I feel safe, I feel protected. Is this person a blood relative or is this person on a salary somewhere in a childcare center? You know, it's just, it needs that human support. So thank you. We rehearsed that one. Didn't that go for you? <laughs> well, um, before we wrap up, Josh or Jessica, do you have anything to add? And I have to say, I think that was a very wonderful way to end the questions. And uh, thank you all. And uh, we hope it was worth uh, your evening and none of you were terrorized by this presentation. <laughs>